show you an intermediate and tell you what happens next and ask you to dry diagram it or ask you a question about it that reflects your understanding of the principles of the mechanism without necessarily have to draw it, have to draw it all out. Right? Without having to draw it all out. Yeah. What's the specific interaction that shifts the PKA of moving up so that it can actually face the start off with? Well, we definitely want to have the glue be negatively charged. Right? And so at neutral pH, it is negatively charged. So we don't necessarily need a big a pK shift of the glue. We do have to be able to um, uh, you know, have it protonate at a, at a pH that's somewhere around neutrality. Um, so if we want to drive the, 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 uh, the pKa up a bit, um, then we would um, look at what in the microenvironment would have the proton affinity of glue higher so that it picked it up at a lower proton concentration and so you know what would that do what would that be that would be some negatively charged group nearby or a general negative electrostatic potential nearby so we don't have the details we would have to look at the structure and that's generally the case we won't have those kinds of details yeah so does this does this make sense is this um, in terms of the how the how the flow of electrons goes and the um, it's just, I drew this out in more detail than is in the book. Um, and sometimes I do this just because I think it's, it's, it's pretty hard to follow it, or impossible to follow it if you just have a couple steps. So the, the, what was on the slide didn't have as much detail in the mechanism. Okay, so um, that was step two. And step three is really a lot like step one. We're phosphorylating fructose 6-phosphate. So step one was phosphorylating glucose, exokinase. Step three is phosphorylating glucose 6-phosphate, or sorry, fructose 6-phosphate, and that is phosphofructokinase, another kinase, right? So this delta G zero prime, um, reflects the difference in the free energy levels of ATP versus the sugar phosphate. And you use up another ATP here, and the overall reaction is favorable because that provides more than enough energy to synthesize this medium energy, medium high energy sugar phosphate compound. Right. So under the cellular conditions, in the conditions in most cells, this is the irreversible step that says, okay, we're going to glycolysis now. Right. Up before this point, you can get to fructose 6-phosphate and still direct it in other directions. You direct the carbon in that, fuel, in that potential fuel molecule into, say, sugar storage or something else. But once you go here, the carbon is pretty much committed to going through glycolysis. Um, there's some differences. There's some, some types of phosphocryptic kinases in different organisms will use um, pyrophosphate instead of ATP as a phosphate donor. So the energy of driving PPI to two phosphates, that's less favorable. So um, we can imagine that that enzyme has other kind of characteristics to compensate. The only one other point to make here is that this is a huge major point of, of regulation in the pathway, right? So PFK, notice it says PFK1, right? It turns out there's gonna be a PFK2, right? But we don't have to worry about that yet. That's gonna be involved in regulation. But this, this is an allosteric enzyme, right? And it's gonna be a major point of regulation in the pathway. Okay. okay, so the fourth step is the, um, the aldolase step, right? So um, now we're cleaving the carbon-carbon bond. Right? So this is probably the most difficult step in the, in the pathway. And here we have, um, a delta G zero prime, which is strongly unfavorable under standard state conditions, but which is near zero under cellular conditions. And in fact, this reaction goes forwards or backwards in the cell, depending on whether you want to take glucose and drive it to pyruvate like we're talking about now, or what if there is so much energy around the cell that we, we, we the cell prefers to take pyruvate and drive it back to glucose. Can we just use all the same enzymes and run them backwards? Depends on the 
Well, the last one you just said is irreversible. Sorry? You just said the last, step three is irreversible. Exactly. So we can't use all the same enzymes. But we can use seven of them. And this is one of those seven. Right? So seven of, this, like, seven of the steps in glycolysis go in reverse for the pathway that goes from pyruvate to glucose. Right? That's called gluconeogenesis, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on in the class. It turns out that the re reactions that are going to be the, the subject of regulation are going to be the ones right, that are not reversible. And we'll get into the, explaining why that is. Would you repeat that? Sorry? Would you repeat that? The, the reactions that are um, irreversible are the ones that are going to be regulated. The ones that are reversible under cellular conditions will be able to go, will go either way. And so those are not points of regulation. Okay, so this is not a point of regulation. So aldolase can go the other way and just combine these two compounds. Okay. Um, so this is an example of um, a carbon-carbon bond formation reaction of which there are different kinds in cells. Um, so this is a little organic chemistry. The aldol condensation or the clays and ester condensation are mechanisms by which we can form carbon-carbon bonds. Notice that they're going through a carbanion. That's the most important mechanism in the cell, and that's the mechanism, the aldolase uh, enzyme goes through a carbanion, uh, as we're about to see. This is actually a carbon-carbon breakage reaction. This is a decarboxylation of a beta amino acid. This, this turns out to be a very important reaction in metabolism as well, because CO2 is a very low energy metabolite, and so thermodynamically, that reaction is typically favorable. Like if you can decarboxylate so that helps, the, for example, the process of the TCA cycle and any of the, any of the enzymes where we're burning glucose and we're, we've got it all the way to CO2 and we lose, we lose the carbon as CO2 and we've lost it as a very low energy form. Right? So that's a thermodynamic driver. Okay. So um, this is a complicated mechanism um, to look at how um, how aldolase works. So we'll just break it down a little bit. And so um, we're getting a lot of mechanism now. As we go on through the course, there'll be substantially less mechanism. Okay? Because we'll get into aspects like regulation and such. Um, but for now, we could say that if we want to cleave carbon carbon or carbon hydrogen bonds, um, we could just say there's, we could just look and see there's a couple of different ways to do it. So we could do what's called homolytic cleavage, in which we would generate, we would, we would divide the electrons here on, on both to the carbon and the hydrogen, if it's a C8 bond, and generate free radicals. Right? This is quite uncommon in cells to have this happen. There are free radical reactions. Um, we're not really, we're not studying any of them in, in any detail in this class. We may encounter one or two, um, I just mentioned them. Um, we can have a carbocation, which which, in, which would then uh, necessarily imply it's a CH bond hydride. Or if we're splitting um, a carbon-carbon bond, um, then we would have uh, a carbanion and a carbocation form. Right. So, you know, no matter what, what you're looking at, this is, this is going to be unfavorable, right, no matter what. It's not like an O minus where, you, where the atom is reasonably comfortable accommodating a negative charge. Right. So to get through a transition state, um, or an intermediate, pseudo-stable intermediate that includes a carbanion is not so easy for the enzyme. So it's got to bring a lot of, uh, a lot of catalytic power to be in. And so the, the, the essential secret of that, right, which aldolase uses, um, is this. It's, it's basically to stabilize the carbanion by way of resonance. Right, so that's the, that's the key thing to remember. We're going we're gonna to have a carbanion in the course of cleaving glucose, or rather, in the course of cleaving fructose 1,6-bisphosphate to the 2,3 carbon compounds. Somewhere in, in the middle of that mechanism, there's going to be a carbanion. And what we're going to see is that that carbanion is stabilized by, by the virtue of the fact that there's this carbonyl next door that can accommodate this resonance. Right, so this can be happier if it can also go to that. Similarly, 
we have this structure. This structure here has a, with a carbian line next door is happier because you can go to this. Right? So that's the that's kind of the secret of how these enzymes work. And so aldolase um, is an example of this one. And so the enzyme goes through a lot of effort to set up the set it up, so to speak, to set it up so that this can be a possibility. And so this N is going to be coming from a, a lysine on the enzyme. Okay. So if we look at it here, <coughs> here's the lysine on the enzyme. Here's the substrate, bind open the ring. Okay, so you're linear. Okay. So here's a lysine on the enzyme attacking at C2. Now, in step two of glycolysis, we moved the carbonyl group. It was an aldehyde at C1. Now it's a keto at C2. Right? So that's crucial for this reaction to actually go, to generate two three carbon compounds, which can then be interconverted so that only one of them has to go forward. Right? So that's a key part of the logic of the pathway, is to, have, is, to, is to set up the cleavage reaction, which is here, right, on a compound that has a carbonyl at C2. So that this is this nucleophilic attack here, so this lysine clearly had to be deprotonated first. NH3 plus on the lysine is not going to be a favorable nucleophile. So this is deprotonated first. That's not a huge pK shift because under solution conditions of lysine pK is about 10. So it can come down. Right? So this attack here is, an, is a general acid on the enzyme, okay, which is used to protonate the oxygen. So this would go 